they're going to meet the Fed on the way up. So, you know, there's a lot of people predicting that the Fed was going to hike rates by, you know, 3% or whatever. They're never going to get there. Probably the Fed's going to get to maybe 2% before they stop. And what will happen is the two-year Treasury is going to come down and the Fed's going to meet them at about one and three quarters to 2%. And that'll probably be about the peak of where the Fed goes. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap featuring my good friend Lance Roberts. Lance, how are you, buddy? It's great to see you. It's been a better week this week, so we got that going for us. Yeah, I'll bet it's been a lot more fun. So um, yes. look, let, let's kick this off. Here's, here's my question. This might be the theme for the week. If you get a different one, feel free to toss it in there. But bounce. You know, we um, we have had, uh, you know, the, the, at the very end of last Friday, the market, uh, you know, kind of raced, uh, you know, higher at the end of uh, in the last couple of minutes of the market action. And it didn't look back this week. This market uh, pretty much just went up every day this week. Um, you know, I think we closed the last week around thirty nine hundred. Uh, we're now here at forty one forty four. So is this the bounce uh, that we've been looking for? Is the short-term bottom in? What do you think? Well, I, you know, I, you know, yes, I, I think we have a short-term bottom here. And, and again, the reason I say that is simply because now the market has moved above that 20-day moving average. And really, ever since the beginning of this year, every time that we come down uh, in this market, and particularly since the peak of the market in March, every time we've rallied, we've rallied right back to that 20-day moving average, failed, and then went lower. This is the first time that we've now moved above that 20-day moving average. We've also turned up a MACD buy signal for the first time uh, since the previous lows back in March that led to that rally that we had in March. This is the first buy signal. So we have a confirmed buy signal. We've got the market above initial resistance. And that suggests that we've got enough buying power here to push the markets a little bit more. But, you know, don't get too complacent. We're not back into the bull market by any stretch of, you know, of the imagination. This is a rally you want to sell into. You know, we talked about, I think, a couple of weeks ago, the average investor is down about 30 percent so far this year. There's a whole lot of what we call trapped longs. And these are people that are long the market. They're tired of getting beat up here and they've just been sitting around going, Hey, you know, that Lance guy, that, that idiot on Wealthion, he told me there's going to be a rally. So as, as, if that rally ever comes, I'm going to sell into uh, it. Fingers on the and, sell button. And yeah, so, exactly. You know, it's very likely going to be the case. We'll see a lot of movement towards the exits on this rally. All right. Um, well, look, so you have been saying for weeks and weeks now that you expected for there to be some sort of bounce here, a tradable bounce or a sellable yeah. bounce. Um, are you selling yet at this point or are you waiting, are you expecting this to go a bit higher before you start actually lightening up? We'll probably start, we'll probably start trimming off next week. Um, two things next week are, uh, it's the end of the month and it is also this, um, you know, uh, it's going to be a holiday short week. So trading volume will be, will be a little bit lighter. So in other words, the inmates will be running the asylum next week. Hmm. So, you know, very likely we could see this market push up a, a little bit more. But, yeah, we're going to start reducing some exposure, uh, try to trend. We, you know, we added some exposure back here near the bottom. Uh, we talked about it on the show a couple yep. of weeks ago. We bought Abbott and United Healthcare and some other things. And those have been doing really, really well here. So now we'll probably start going in and, and kind of rebalancing some of our tech exposure, some of our growth stocks, reducing those a little bit more, even though we're already pretty underweight growth. And, uh, and kind of just rebalancing our value proposition in our portfolio a bit as well as we get ready to move kind of into a, a slower economic environment later this year. Okay. Um, so I've been looking at your daily alerts. Um, it doesn't look like you've been buying much super recently, but I guess any, any notable trades in the past week, or is it really more watching here now to get to the point where you want to start trimming? No, we, we were kind of in a position for this rally um, two weeks ago. And the market's really done nothing over the last two weeks. We just kind of bounced around a lot. So there really wasn't anything for us to do this week except let this rally happen because we kind of already positioned for it. So bonds have been working really well here as of late. And, and we've seen bond prices come up and now we're getting the equity bounce as well. So kind of every, you know, kind of all cylinders are firing at one time here and that's great. So now we're just kind of letting the market come to us 
and then we'll use this rally again, like we said, just to start repositioning and raise a little bit more cash, reposition a little bit on the on the exposure side, um, and then go from there. Okay, so you mentioned bonds. Um, bonds did have a good week last week. I would say that continued this week, although it, it's it's they, they hung in there. They're they're up a little bit more than they were with the start of the beginning of the week, but they're not up dramatically here. Um, I know that's a longer term position for you. So as you start lightening up on some of the equities, are you looking to get trim any of the TLT or are you literally going to hold on to that for another quarter or two? Um, no, actually, we're going to add to it um, here at some point, because, again, the, the tailwind for um, bonds is just now really starting to come into focus. Uh, technically, we just completed a head and shoulders pattern in interest rates. So very much like the stock market, we've now completed a head and shoulders pattern in interest rates, suggesting that we've seen the peak in interest rates. Uh, and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about inflation here on the show so at some point today, but uh, there's more and more evidence coming in that inflation is now peaked. And as inflation declines and as economic growth slows, that is all very bond bullish. So no, what we'll be actually doing is now shifting our... So when you look at our bond portfolio, we have our bond portfolio really tilted towards the short end of the curve. And so what we're talking about, a very small position of TLT in our portfolio, we've got a lot sitting in one to three year duration bonds on the very short end of the curve. So those will start to come out, uh, floating rate bonds and very short duration bonds will start to move into the TLT position as we begin to see that slower economic environment, slower inflationary environment, because that's where bonds will really start to perform well. Um, all right, Lance, and I just want to clarify on one thing. You said you, you, we may have seen the peak in interest rates. I assume you, you really mean the peak in bond yields, right? Because the Fed presumably is still going to be hiking its interest rates over the next couple of months, correct? Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So yeah, let's let's be specific. The Fed's not done, <laughs> but the ten-year Treasury and actually interest rates in general are probably telling you that the that they're going to be coming down, and they're going to meet the Fed on the way up. So you know, there's a lot of people predicting that the Fed was going to hike rates by you know three percent or whatever. They're never going to get there. Probably the Fed's going to get to maybe two percent before they stop. And what will happen is the two-year treasury is going to come down and the Fed's going to meet them at about one and three quarters to 2%. And that'll probably be about the peak of where the Fed goes. Okay. Um, well, let, let's talk about the Fed for a moment because um, there were a couple of different um, you know, media appearances by the Fed this week. And um, uh, I want to hammer a couple of things they said because it's it's somewhat supportive and relevant to, to what you just said. Um, so the Fed has said, hey, yeah, we're still on track for um, 50 basis point hikes, both in June and July, right? So they're, they're sticking to their guns in the short term here. <laughs> at um, least for now. <laughs> at least for now. Um, they did say, quote, the economy is very strong and, quote, the labor market is very tight. Um, so they're still, they're still basically saying more or less what Powell said, you know, in his press conference three weeks ago, uh, things are still hot both economically, jobs-wise and inflation-wise, and we got to do what we got to do to bring demand down. Um, which, I, which, I, is, I, which, which, by the way, that's all fine and dandy, you know, right now, but they're looking at lagging data. Oh, and absolutely. That, and and, and real-time data is slowing down very rapidly here. So it's it's great conversation that he's jawboning out to the media, but the reality is, is that's not what's going on here. Well, that's where I'm going with this. And I, yeah. honestly, I don't think anybody with eyes is really believing <laughs> what he's saying. Um, but I do want to say, uh, that said, uh, uh, Fed President, uh, President of the Fed of Atlanta, Raphael Bostic, did float a trial balloon this week of yeah, we're going to hike in June and July, and they're going to be aggressive about it. But but maybe we should just pause in September and see what things look like then, and then decide what to do. Right. So that's the first, as the first, you know, sort of moderating comment that's now come out of the Fed. And I think that deliberately was a trial balloon. They had you know oh, yeah. Bostic down there in Atlanta, floated up to see what folks uh, <laughs> think, and then Loretta Mester, um, who I think is from the the Fed Bank of Cleveland came out and said, um, you know, and, and actually we could slow one of these 50 basis points increase down to a 25% base increase if inflation looks like it's starting to moderate. 
don't see that yet, but just in case it does, we could, right? right? And I think they're saying that because Lance, as you and I have been talking about, you just mentioned, you know, it is increasingly looking like that our prediction that the CPI peaked in uh, April, April uh, is probably likely going to happen. And um, I want to, I want to just briefly mention some st uh, stats here uh, that the uh, core PCA, the latest core PCE data that was released today, um, uh, shows that uh, it is uh, beginning to decline. Um, so whatever you want to call disinflation in PCE, uh, we're seeing right now. So it was the first core PCE print below 5% in, in 2022, so the lowest increase for the year. Uh, the past several um, the past several months have been sh showing uh, decreasing growth, uh, and what's important about this is, you know, this is this is a track of the growth in consumer spending that drives two thirds of the economy. Um, it, you would expect it to be pretty highly correlated with the CPI, right? That as inflation rages, personal consumption to a certain extent is going to mm -hmm. rage because people are, are paying higher prices uh, for stuff. Of course, until demand destruction starts really biting, so. Um, you know, we're trying to tile this together here is we may start seeing inflation come down. And as we have been talking about in this program, the Fed may use that as the reason to you know begin moderating its tough talk. And to your point, by the time the Fed funds rate meets uh, the market set interest rates um, or yields, um, the Fed at that point, you know, maybe trying to engineer that, hey, by the time we get there, we're going to have lined up all the reasons to say, yeah. you know what, we're kind of wrapping up early here. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so, yeah, you're right. You know, PCE, by the way, is, has been down four months in a row. Um, so, you know, it's been coming down over the last right. four months. But just to be clear, the, the growth has been coming down. Yeah, correct. The, the, the rate of change has been yes. coming down. Uh, but importantly, though, to, to this whole conversation, the Fed doesn't care about CPI. They look at PCE. So this is their, so the, the Fed's preferred measure is what they call the trimmed mean PCE. That's, that don't even worry about it. It's just, they're not looking at CPI. They're looking at personal consumption expenditures, which is already feeding into their loop of data showing that the economy is weakening, that prices are coming down. And this is gonna be more problematic for them with them trying to hike rates. And, and again, to your point, it was interesting to see, you know, uh, you know, first, Bostick's very dovish. So, you know, everybody kind of dismissed him right away. But um, Messer is, and she's more hawkish. So for her to come out and say, hey, you know what, we might ease up here a little bit. That's actually, you know, something the markets took to heart. And that's why we saw such a rally this week, because now all of a sudden, the Fed may not be as aggressive as was previously expected, you know, and not that you haven't been hearing that between me and Adam now for the last month and a half, because we've been saying the Fed's going to be less aggressive because they simply can't. They're going to hike rates and they're going to bust something in the economy or in the markets. And the question is only what, when and where and, and how it happens. And, and, and so real time data has been coming in here lately. And, you know, we've had 1.4 percent GDP growth negative in the first quarter. Second quarter GDP growth now, according to the Atlanta Fed, is going to be below 2%. And by the time I think we get through June, we may be coming on down to see maybe sub 1% growth in the, in the second quarter, if not closer to zero. We'll see. Um, you know, we did have a little bit of improvement in some of the, the data in the second quarter. But again, when you're talking about negative 1.4% and maybe 1% in the second quarter, that's zero for the year. Basically, it's negative for the year so far. That's going to be really hard by the end of this year for the Fed to justify hiking rates if the economy is growing at roughly zero. Uh, that's, going to, that's going to put the Fed in a really tough box on rate side. Okay. Um, well, look, I want to talk about another um, another of the Fed's strategies here that I think we've yet to see the implications of, and they could be quite material. And that's the onset of quantitative tightening. Right. right. To date, it's just been talked about, but but now starting next month, we begin to ramp it up. And the Fed is essentially over the next three months trying to get up to by September, it wants to be pulling um, 90 billion a month off of its balance sheet. Um, I think that's uh, 30 billion in mortgage backed securities and 60 billion in treasuries. Right. Um, and one of the things that's material about quantitative tightening is uh, 
we have a, an economy that is lubricated by credit, right? Credit is sort of the lifeblood as to how it all works. And what we are now doing is, you know, the Fed has been the biggest buyer, certainly at the margin for the past decade, right? And now the Fed's kind of going on a buying strike. Um, and the the outcome of that is, is as the Fed's hiking the Fed funds rate and as the bond market has already driven yields higher already this year, the cost of capital has been going up, right? And it might still, it might start moderating like you're saying, Lance, but it's still a lot higher than it's been in previous years. Um, but now the quantity of capital is beginning to go down, right? Or at least it's not growing the way that it did. And for an economy that is, has become addicted to kind of like almost limitless cheap credit, we're entering a very different world, right? Um, and that's what a world where certainly zombie companies are going to have a lot tougher time because the capital they're, they're getting to, to try to roll over their debt is more expensive. And they might not be able to get that capital as easily as they did, right? So how, how material is the onset of quantitative tightening in your mind? Well, it's going to be pretty – well, so first of all, let's just – be really clear. This doesn't mean the, the the Federal Reserve is selling bonds, right? So one of the, the big concerns is like, oh my gosh, when the Fed just starts dumping their balance sheet, this is going to cause interest rates to go to the moon. That's that's not what we're talking about here. What's going to happen is that when we were doing Q, so this started actually back in 2019. Most people don't know that we were doing a backdoor quantitative easing in 2019 because we were bailing out hedge funds um, with reverse repo. So the the Fed was pulling onto their balance sheet of lot, a lot of very short duration T bills, and and they were buying some bonds, but a lot of bills and shorter duration maturities. So they've been doing that here for the last couple of years. And so what will happen now is they will simply just say we're not going to buy as many bonds, and we're going to allow these bonds we have on our balance sheet to to begin to roll off. So as they mature then they'll simply either not replace bonds or they will replace whatever bonds they need. So, so let's say that, that in, uh, in any given month, they're going to do, in, they have 90 billion that they want to reduce their balance sheet by, but let's say in a given month, they have a hundred billion dollars worth of bonds maturing, then that means they'll go out and they'll buy $10 billion worth of bonds and let 90 billion, you know, just mature and roll off the balance sheet. So it's not necessarily this fear that the Fed is going to be dumping bonds in the market. They will be. They will be selling some bonds because some months they may only have 50 billion maturing. So they've got to sell 40, right? Um, but that's going to be that process they're working through. But it's not going to be this you know, immediate cram down on the markets. But it is, importantly, a reduction in that liquidity. They are removing that liquidity by reducing the amount of excess reserves that are sitting on bank balance sheets, et cetera, which is what has been funneled into the markets in various measures. So it is going to have an impact. It is going to reduce that whole bias of the market that the Fed's doing QE. That means buy stocks. We are reversing that. And, and that's another reason that talking about this rally, the reason we want to sell into this rally is because we are about to start quantitative tightening. And historically, at least in what you know, small historical you know precedents we have, equity markets don't perform well when the Fed's reducing their balance sheet. So you know we want to reduce equities, we want to buy bonds because guess what, bonds do really well when the Fed's reducing their balance sheet. All right, so um, let's let's now kind of pivot and look at the the landscape ahead. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but I've I've had some recent discussions with. Some other experts on this channel. So, um, you know, somebody could somebody could look at the market this week and say, "Oh gosh, you know what? It, 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 it bottomed. It's bouncing here." Uh, I agree with Lance. I think uh, that that yields have have peaked, and um, you know, maybe the Fed's going to going to be able to stop sooner than it's been telling us in terms of its tightening efforts and all that stuff. So they could kind of walk away with kind of a rosy picture here. But um, as you just mentioned, um, we actually think that that there's still trouble ahead for the financial markets. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a not unsubstantial part of that is the fact that I think we think that the, the, the probability of approaching recession is, is, is pretty high at this point. Can't say it's guaranteed, but I think I, I, I think it's likely, I won't put words in your mouth, but my, my guess is you probably feel pretty similar. 
So that's just the financial markets. And we talked a bit about this last week, but then there's the housing market, right? right? And um, we've been kind of beating the drum recently about the concerns we have there. I think we just continue to see more and more evidence that um, uh, you know, sales are struggling, that, that uh, price decreases are now increasing, um, which is something that we never even saw up until just a couple right. of months back. Right. Um, and then I want to talk about the jobs market too, because <laughs> that is fast deteriorating as well. I mean, we, we still have pals, you know, two openings for every applicant ringing in our ears. But if you look at, uh, I mean, honestly, if you just look at the layoff data, which, right. you know, there's a progression you go through before you actually get to the layoffs. But I mean, layoffs themselves are already increasing dramatically. And I want to, I want to just mention this one quote here, um, Piper Sandler's chief economist, Nancy Lazar, just said, we could see a million layoffs or more as many good sectors that benefited from the pandemic now realize they added too much capacity. Um, so, uh, and that's just on the good side. So um, we could have really sort of like a triple whammy here where we have a, a material correction in the financial markets, in the housing markets, and in the jobs markets. So, you know, as you kind of look out <laughs> ahead, Lance, how worried are you about, about well, the coming year? Well, that's a recession is what you're talking about. So uh, it is, but, that's, but, that's, but, but, that's, but it's not, that's a, what not a blink and you miss a recession like we had last no, year. Two years no, ago. no. Well, that so was a legit recession. Okay. Right. Well, that wasn't really a recession, right? That was an economic, that was a man-made artificial economic shutdown. So yeah, it was a recession because we laid off a bunch of people, but, you know, that didn't happen of of just organic nature. This is going to be more of an organic recession. It'll be it'll last longer. But look, here's the thing. Right now, are we going to have a recession? The answer is probably yes. But the the timing is going to be the issue. There's too many people talking about a recession right now. We talked about this last week. You know, 8,200 articles written on the coming recession. You know, it, it just and and normally when you have the media and everybody talking about something like that, it's not going to happen. At least right now. And what I'll, so here's what I suspect the, the order of magnitude will be is that, you know, we're going to have this rally and it'll be, and this rally could be stronger than a lot of people expect. And which will be great because it'll get Jim Cramer back into the markets. So as I thought the bear, the, the bear market bottom is in and, you know, bull markets back, look how strong the economy is. It's great. You know, Jerome Powell engineered the the soft landing, you know, first time ever, you know, three stuck point it. touchdown. Yeah, I stuck it. You know, that's what you need to hear. And when you start hearing that, that's when you want to start becoming more cautious, because then what this is what bull markets, this is what markets do. Bull mar you know, markets tend, and especially bear markets, they will suck investors in um, with these with these counter trend rallies, making you think that the bull market's back, and that's when the trap door opens underneath you, and then it's kind of you know Katie bar the door, you know that's my suspicion of what's going to happen here at some point because there's just really too many people really way too bearish about the markets right now. Everybody's on the in the bearish camp. You know, equity exposure on hedge funds, mutual funds, etc., at extremely low levels. You know, sentiment is extremely negative. We got to reverse all that before you can actually have a bear market. So again, I think this this recent bottom, we get that reflexive rally. It's stronger than people expect, sucks people back into the market. And that's where you want to be a little bit more cautious. Great. Well, okay. So that, that's where I'm going here. So I'm, I'm trying to look at kind of like a year timeline yeah. here and say, look, I, I think, think the right. odds of recession then are, are pretty good with in all the three areas we talked about stocks, you know, financial markets, housing, and jobs. And um, I want folks to be looking at that because that's going to help them steal themselves from the siren song of the short term you just talked about, right? right? When everybody's back on you know, CNBC saying, oh, look, the stock market's on fire right now. And everybody that sold and just held you know, cash, they're all idiots and they're missing right. the party here, right? So it's going to be real. It's going to be a huge lure to try to get back in, right? So um, want to make sure people are emotionally steeled for that. But also, um, I'm glad that uh, it's not likely not going to happen as quickly as you say most people think it could. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, I mean, we, we could be in one right now, right? Sure. Um, at least the early stages. Um, but, uh, but the longer it takes to arrive in force means the longer time people have to prepare for it in advance now. And when we talked last week, 
you surprise me by saying, hey, yeah, I'm putting my house up on the market this weekend. Uh, yeah. We just made the decision that we're going to do it, right? It yeah, actually sounds like you have an update on that first. So before <laughs> yeah. I continue, you have an update on that, right? Yeah, it's old. So it took four <laughs> That's days. That's amazing. <laughs> so so it, it's kind of interesting, though, we were talking about the housing market is that, you know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, price declines around the country and these kind of really overpriced, you know, Canada, California, you know, New York, you know, we're seeing a lot of price declines. You know, I live in Houston, Texas, and that hasn't got here yet, but we didn't have the big run up either. So, you know, housing is very market centric and it's also very, you know, uh, economically centric, depending on, you know, where you are within the country. So, Again, you know, the reason that we're selling the house is because we see, you know, we we all we've been talking about what's coming, right? Higher interest rates, the housing prices will, will, will peak and 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 go down. So we're selling our house and we're going to go rent for a few years and you know wait for our next opportunity to buy something cheap because it's an asset for us too. Um, but yeah, so you know, right now it's still a very crazy market here in Houston. So you know, we're taking advantage of it. But it, it, I do think that in the course of the next, you know few months to later on this year, as the Fed continues to hike rates, once we get into a deeper bear market and we get in that recession, that it even slows down here in Houston as well. Yeah. All right. So anyways, I'm glad that you are kind of leading the charge uh, in not just words, but actions, right? Saying, hey, look, <laughs> given where I think things are going, I'm taking steps now. Because at the end of the day, I mean, that's that's the business you and, and other you know good financial advisors are in right now right. is trying to prepare people for what's coming. And part of your job is to prod them and to say, hey, you can't just talk about this stuff all day long. You actually got to take action. Right. right? right. Um, so I presume you're having your firms having conversations like this with folks. But um, I guess sort of two questions for you. When is going to be, you know, are there other steps that you would recommend that people, you know, start taking today, right? And, and I'm, I'm not recommending, I don't think you're recommending everybody should go out and sell their house today if you're a homeowner, <laughs> but you should kind of do an audit, right? And just say, look, where am I exposed and what things can I do today to, to make myself less exposed? Um, and obviously, I guess the biggest one would probably just be like, well, look, you know, update your plan or if you don't have one, make a plan, right? right. Don't go into this just sort of, you know, like you're, you're just going to wing it, right? Um, well, I guess first, let me let you ask that question, then I have sort of a follow-up one. Yeah. So I actually just wrote an article on our website. Uh, if you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, it's called How to Invest in a Recession. Um, it's it's on the website. It's uh, right. So if you go to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, click on Insights, uh, it'll bring up our blog. And it's like the third blog down, but it's called How to Invest in a Recession. And look, there's some basic things that you just have to prepare to do. So if you're going to get in a recession, there's some risk that that show up, right? So one is, you know, if you were thinking about selling your house because you're going to move somewhere within the next year or two, uh, you may want to accelerate that plan a bit because during a recession, house prices are going to fall and the value you get for your property is going to be less. So, you know, that's, and that's where my wife and I are right now. We're, we're within three to four years of moving somewhere for our kind of our retirement, you know, you know, plot uh, where she's going to bury me in the backyard. So, you know, <laughs> It, you know, it just, you know, it makes sense to take advantage of that now. And, and obviously, if you've got a family with young kids going to school, you, that's not an option for you right now. So it, it, that's very, that's very timing specific uh, to where you are in life. But uh, the one thing that happens during recession is you run a risk of losing your job. Company goes out of business, company downsizes, whatever it is. So make sure that you've got some extra cash put away in the bank. If you have three months worth of emergency funds, maybe make it six or nine months. Uh, give yourself some time so you're not forced to go sell down equity assets just to try to pay bills. Um, another thing you can do is also take advantage right now of tax loss selling. Um, you know, we had a lot of gains from last year and with markets down where we are, a lot of people now have some negative assets. Take advantage of that. Raise some cash in your portfolio. Do some tax loss selling now and have that tax benefit picked up, you know, for as we move into the next year, as we start to buy the bottom, wherever that bottom is ultimately, and we're going to make some gains coming out of this bear market at some point. We'll have those tax losses we can carry forward to offset taxes in the future. You know, also to start thinking about repositioning the portfolio to weather a recessionary period. That means, you know, less, you know, focus on stocks that make money versus, you know, you know stocks that don't make money. Value stocks continue to be a great place to be even during a recessionary environment. And don't forget about bonds because, again, you know, we talk about bonds a lot here, but bonds do well during recessions because money moves into safety assets. So those are things that you can start doing right now just to prepare for a recession. But investing, you know, through the recession, there's going to be some great opportunities. But 
if you don't sell some stuff, you know, and have some cash, you can't buy those. This is the problem with buy and hold investing. It sounds great on the surface that you're just going to kind of ride all this stuff out. But reality is, is that never actually happens. And the second thing is you don't have any cash to buy with when really good opportunities come along. And we're going to see some great opportunities here in the next year or so. All right. That's a great laundry list. And yeah, folks, um, if you're interested in that, definitely go to Lance's uh, website and read that article. Um, I've mentioned this in previous videos this week, too. But if you're an employee, if you have, get a paycheck you know, for your income, um, we've got a free guide uh, over at Wealthion.com slash layoffs. Uh, it's the layoff survival guide. Um, it just gives you kind of a laundry list of things that you can do today if you think there's a potential that you could get a pink slip or get your hours cut or whatnot during a recession from your employer. Um, totally free resource to, to go read and, and, and just dial through, but it's recommended as just something to spend 30 seconds at least doing uh, because there's a lot of helpful resources in there uh, that if you decide to put them into motion today can really help protect you down the road. Um, one thing you said there, Lance, I want to dig into real quickly, um, or at least just flag for folks is um, you talked about, you know, sort of tax harvesting, um, which definitely folks should do. There's a risk I just want to note for people who um, have had big gains and are still deploying that money into something else. Uh, I'm, I'm, I recall back in the, uh, the dot-com era, right before the bust, um, there were people that uh, exercised options. Um, or they, they, they sold stock that had gone up tremendously and then they put it in something else. So they had these big taxable gains that they were going to have to pay come next tax year. And then they lost the value uh, of, of the, you know, whatever they're invested in lost a lot of value as the recession hit. So by the time the tax season next year came around, they basically didn't have any assets anymore, but they had this big tax liability to the government. So I see a smiling kind of laughing as I'm saying this, but but that's something you got to watch out for here if you're, let's say, like a big crypto trader or something like that, correct? No, I mean, that's absolutely right. That's what a lot, I actually had a guy call me a couple of weeks ago. He's like, hey, I've got some rental properties. Will you buy them from me? Because I, I do hard money lending. That's one of the things I do. And he's like, he called me up. He's like, I've got some rental properties. Will you buy them from me? Because I just got hit by a huge, you know, tax bill that I can't pay from my crypto trading. And I'm like, you know, sure, I'll give you 50 cents on the dollar for your properties. <laughs> you, know, you know, so, you know, that's, been, that's exactly what happens with a lot of people. And, and what I'm talking about with tax loss harvesting is not really that, right? I'm not saying go out and sell your stuff now and rack up a bunch of gains. But a lot you. of people, but a lot of people have gains from 2020, 2021. And now a lot of those gains and some of the stocks they had are now losses, you know, the, the Pelotons and that type of thing. Those aren't coming back anytime soon. The ARC type stocks aren't coming back. Sell them, get them off the book, take the loss. They're not going to save you. Get the money invested where it can grow for you and, and be more protected during recession. And then at least you have that tax loss that you can offset in the future when we start generating gains again. All right. All right. Great. Um, all right. So I want to I want to take it now in another direction. And um, uh, I'm going to see if I can avoid triggering your your weekly rant here, Lance. Um, so my wife is a, a couples therapist. And we were talking the other day about uh, the big three, which um, these are the three biggest friction points um, in most relationships. They're the ones that are the biggest triggers of divorce or just unhappiness. And it's money, it's sex, and it's family. Family's mostly either children or in-laws, right? Um, uh, although she says really money and sex are the two really big ones of, of the top three. Um, but, you know, having been married to her for over 20 years now, and, and, you know, she kind of, she can't tell me names, but she tells me a lot of the issues that she has to deal with. Um, it is amazing what a tremendous factor money is um, in, in the relationship dynamic oftentimes in a pretty negative way or anxiety inducing way. And, uh, and I think that only gets exacerbated uh, during times of, of vulnerability or loss. Um, you know, certainly, you know, going into recession when there's losses in the nest egg, income loss, et cetera. Um, and I know that as a, as a financial advisor, you, you kind of almost have to be part therapist as part of the job, right? So I, I guess I just want to sort of tread into whatever territory you feel like talking to here about 
you know, what, what are some of the biggest issues that you see, you know, people, couples, families sort of struggling with around money right now? And, and do you agree that, that we could be entering a period of time where those stressors are going to get worse? And so, you know, again, that's maybe one other thing we want to work on is the, the resilience of the relationship with the people in our lives that we have to deal with around money. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's interesting, you, you know, you're absolutely right. Money and sex are the, are the two biggest causes for divorce in the country, period. And look, it, it's a pretty simple formula. Uh, and when you talk about sex, it's, it's the lack of sex. And the other is infidelity, right? And those, those two, when you talk about sex, those two go together. Yep. But look, it's a pretty simple formula here is that if you're having money problems, it's almost guaranteed that you're not having sex. And if you're not having sex and somebody's <laughs> going to cheat on somebody, I mean, it just kind of rolls downhill. And I don't think that, I don't think that's rocket science here for anybody, but you know, look, if you're fighting over money, nobody wants, is like, hey, you know, I, I'm mad at you because, you know, you're spending too much and I'm in debt, let's go have sex. And that just doesn't happen, right? Um, and, and so these two things, you know, work very, very close together. And, and this is why it's so important for couples to be on the same page when it comes to, you know, financial planning and investing and these type of things. And, and, it's, and it's not the case, you know, the majority of the time when people come into our office, you know, we meet with the husband. Um, sometimes, it, it, not surprisingly at all, the, the wife is taking care of all the investing and all of the bill paying and, and the husband's off doing his thing, right? But it's never, you know, only rarely do we meet with both at the same time. And they're both integrated and they're both, you know, involved in it. Generally, one of the partners is dealing with the money. They know where everything, all the bodies are buried, et cetera. And the other person's like, I don't care. He takes care of that. Or I don't care. She takes care of that. That's her job. But that's a terrible way to approach things because what happens is that when something inevitably goes wrong, the other person's surprised by it. And they're, they're like, well, how did we get here? And then the whole thing kind of blows up. And this is why, you know, money and sex leads to divorces. That's why you have such a high divorce rate in the, in the country now as well because of that. You know, so it's important when we go back, and this is why having a big emergency fund is very important. And just, you know, everybody's like, well, I can't just sit in cash. It's losing out to inflation. No, it's not. It's there. It's there for a reason. You've got it for emergencies in case something goes wrong. And you've got it there in case asset prices crash, then you can go buy stuff really cheap. Cash gives you a lot of liquidity and a lot of options, but it also helps stave off that stress in the marriage because at that point, say, look, honey, you know, we, get, we're, we can't take any money out of our investment portfolio right now, but it's okay. We got cash sitting over here. Hey, I lost my job. It's okay. I got six months to go find a new job. We're okay. You know, that's where all of this, and then you can work as a team to start solving these problems. Okay, honey, I'm going to help you go get a new job. I'm going to, I'm going to call my buddies. I'm going to do whatever. And I'm going to help you get reemployed. You know, whatever it is, we're going to make it, we're going to make it work. And that's what a great partner is. And this is the thing that we really have to approach our relationships as. And, you know, and like my wife and I, you know, I love her very much. She loves me. We, we, we have a, a great relationship, but we are, the, we are best friends and we are partners in business. And we both contribute to running the household. We contribute to our investments. We, we know exactly what, what both parties are doing and what's happening. And so if something happens to me, she knows right where to pick everything up. If something happens to her, you know, I know right where everything is and, and we do this, but we work everything very closely together and it keeps that stress out of the relationship. Because again, because once the money problem is solved, then you just really focus on the next two problems, which are, you know, loving your partner, being a great friend and loving your kids. And my kids are, are the Taliban and we've talked about that before, <laughs> but you know, if they survive the summer and get off to college, you know, this is going to be great. So, you know, but, but it's just a function that, you know, we have to really focus. And, and look, look money's important. And whoever said that money, you know, doesn't buy happiness didn't have any money, right? Because money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys a whole lot of whatever comes in second, but it allows you to be happy. And so if we manage our finances well and build that cushion, so we can focus on being happy. It's a lot easier to have a strong, healthy relationship with your spouse and your kids and everybody else. Once you start getting inducing stress and debt, it's it's a it's it's like drowning in, in quicksand. I mean, it's just you don't get out of it, and it just gets worse. It doesn't get better. Yeah, and and you know, it's one of those things that um, 
each partner brings their own personal baggage around money into a relationship. And oftentimes yeah. it's never addressed before the marriage. You kind of, you, you kind of find out each other's landmines as you step on them once the rings on the finger. Right. Right. Um, and you know, my, my, my wife and you given your professions, you know, th this isn't academic. You, you actually are dealing with the people who. You Every know, day. You, you see the devolution. <laughs> Right. When Every it goes day. wrong, you're the guy they come to when they're bickering about it or I'm yeah. we, 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 we couldn't come to agreement. We're getting divorced and I got, I got to sell my assets with you because I got to give him half or whatever. Right. So um, it, it, it's a real it's a, it's a real, real need. You, 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 you hit like three or four things that I'd, I'd like to try to get at least some progress on some of them before we wrap things up here. Let me start with a positive first, which is, um, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is the healthy way to manage your fund is to be partners in business, as you said, right? Where uh, even if one person has a, a proclivity for investing and a greater interest in all this stuff, ignorance on the other partner's side isn't useful, right? right? And one of the things that I've seen a lot in the years in which I've referred people to advisors like yourself is you have one person who is carrying the weight and, um, one, they might feel a little isolated uh, with that role. They might feel an undue burden of pressure, like, ah, it's all on me to figure out what our financial future is going to be like. But even if they're comfortable with it, once they get later on in life, there begins to become an anxiety of, hey, you know, I, I may go first, right? Yeah. And then I'm worried that my partner doesn't know how to do this. They right. haven't developed the muscles. They At this point in their life, it's not fair to ask them, you know, to, to, to do this. So, um, you know, uh, are, are there ways in which if, if someone's listening to this and saying like, oh, that really kind of sounds like me, <laughs> are, are, are there conversations that you guys can help facilitate or are there, there you know, strategies to kind of get people enough on the page so that if indeed the lead partner is out of the picture for whatever reason, there can be a smoother transition for the, the successor? Yeah, and it's, it's funny because, you know, I tell people all the time that, you know, in our firm, we spend probably 80% of the time being psychologists, whether it's in investing psychology or marital counseling, whatever it is, you know, that's, that's a big chunk of our job every day is just working through these kinds of issues because that's what financial planning is really all about. And, you know, you know, the problem is, and again, with, with partners and, and even great marriages, right? One partner is like, you know, I'm not even interested in money. I've got no interest in investing. I, I, you know, and look, we've raised everybody this way. You know, we don't teach it in school. We don't, you know, economics, boring. Look, you know, and like, there's no, you know, investing radio show that everybody tunes into, right? I mean, the investing shows are very low. You know, everybody wants to listen to a political talk show or whatever, or they want to listen to music, right? They don't listen to investing because it's boring, right? And most people are just like, ah, you know, just boring money. Um, or they've been told it's boring. Or they've been told it's boring, right? Yeah. And, and and look, you know, I do a daily radio show on investing and it's it's boring. No, that's just, you know. <laughs> um, but, but no, the point here is, is, is you're not going to get somebody, I'm not going to change their attitude about getting into investing. They're not going to suddenly turn around and go, oh yeah, I'm going to go study everything I can about investing because right. it's not their interest. It's not what they want to spend their time on. My wife doesn't know, you know, she knows very little about the financial market. She knows where we're invested. She knows what we're invested in. She knows how I'm managing the portfolio, but, you know, she doesn't really, that's, that's as far as it goes. Um, but she trusts me to do my job. I trust her to do her job, which is making sure that our household runs on a budget and that we stay within that budget every month and that we don't, we don't exceed that level. And, and that's her job. And so I have my job is to invest our excess savings. Her job is to live within the budget, make sure the house is taken care of, our Taliban kids are paid for, you know, all that. So, you know, that's how we've broken up our job duties in the house. But she knows that if something happens to me, I've got a, and I encourage everybody to do this. I have a love letter that's written to my wife on, on, on my computer and she knows right where it is. And in that love letter, it tells her, who to call. So in the event of my death, you call this attorney, you call my, you call my financial advisor, Richard Rosso, you call my, you know, accountant, you call, here's all the numbers, here's all our account numbers to the bank, here's all the passwords you need to know, here's all your contacts, and here's the will, here's our trust, you know, all this stuff is packaged up in a very nice little binder for her. So she only has to go to one place. She's not roaming around the house in, in the middle of distress 
right. if I pass away. And this is what happens to so many people. There are financial advisors that spend their whole career reading obituaries. And they're looking for little old ladies whose husbands passed away, left them an insurance policy, and then they go chase after them and convince them to go put all that money into an annuity where they get a big upfront commission. You know, you know, but they just prey on that whole part of that, of that thing. And, and when somebody goes through a passing of a spouse, that is the worst possible time to be making investment decisions. I get call, I got a call from a, 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 a lady just a couple of weeks ago, her husband passed away. And she's like, I don't know what to do with this money. He was always handling the investments. I go, do nothing. Go put it in cash. Call me in a year. And she's like, why in a year? I said, you need to grieve. You need to go spend your time figuring out, you know, what's going on. Go through the grieving process. Go through that, that whole environment. Get yourself situated personally. You can't even think about investing and running a portfolio right now. Put it in cash. Nobody's going anywhere. In a year, call me and we'll start working on this. And she was like, great. Thank you very much. You know, and, and, and that's, you know, but unfortunately, that's the things we have to do. So what we need to do as, as, as both spouses is have that preparation in place so that when that grieving moment comes, you know, that's the worst time to be making decisions, but all that should already be done. You know, my wife does not like dealing with mortality. Whenever I start talking about, you know, estate planning or anything like this, she's like, I don't want to know. But yeah, exactly. Don't, I don't want to hear it. I was like, honey, you have to. And I try to make it as easy as I can on her, but you know, her imagining us not being together is a very tough challenge for her, but she's, you know, it's, it's something we can't avoid. We're all going to die eventually. And I'm convinced she's poisoning my cupcakes anyway, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but anyway, that's, you know, that's the important thing here. And we just have to, to, to do that, but you're not going to change that mentality of somebody not wanting to know about investing to making them an investor You've just got to make sure they know where everything is and that they've got somebody that they can refer to in the event that you're not there. And so this is where you build a relationship with a good financial advisor somewhere, doesn't matter where, but find somebody says, look, in the event of my death, I need you to take this over. And my wife needs to be able to trust you. That's exactly kind of where I'm going with this, which is, look, the best is kind of the equally shared approach where both people are co-developing this, right? But but as I'm hearing you say, is it, it's rare because people have their areas of specialization, just like you and your wife do, right? Um, so, you know, what you want to do is you want to have the, the spouse that is not running the show to at least understand the why and the who, meaning, okay, why are we investing this way? I don't need to understand exactly what you're doing or how you do it, or, you know, I don't have to understand economic theory or anything like that, but I, we have a shared mission of, okay, we, we, these are our main goals, right? And then you want them to understand the who, which is, okay, if you're not around anymore, <laughs> who's my partner to work on this stuff with, right? And, and, you know, I think a lot of people watching here, again, we're probably you're probably seeing a lot of their relationships, you know, in our discussion here. But there are also a lot of people who are watching this who have been kind of going it solo, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that haven't been working with a financial advisor. They're watching programs like this to get information to put into practice themselves, which is great if, if that's what works best for you. But if you have a spouse that is going to take the baton from you when you go, if they're not prepared to do this, then you really should find that successor, Right. And, and have this exact same conversation. And, and Lance, you talked about kind of the, the binder, right, where you have everything pulled together, all the account numbers, uh, you know, the, the trust, the wills, et cetera, all in one place. So it's just a very turnkey thing for the grieving spouse uh, right. to, to have to, to deal with. Uh, it, it is such a I hate to use the term gift in such a morbid situation. But it really is the, one of the kindest things that you can do for them and, and your successors is to have all of that stuff already prepackaged and, and organized for them. Because like you said, Lance, you're not in the mindset to do anything complicated during that process. And, uh, and, and having helped people go through it, it's a nightmare when you're unprepared for it. Yeah. And I tell you, it's one, if, if you've never been through the process of working on somebody else's family, trying to get stuff sorted out, to your point, it's it, it, and, and it's and you're having to chase everything down. It's the worst process ever. It's like an archaeological dig. I it, mean, it is. <laughs> yeah. And everybody and everybody's mad at you. 
everybody's mad at you. <laughs> it doesn't matter. And then, you know, and that's, and look, I, I tell you this, I've been, in, I, I've been doing this for 35 years, 36 years now, whatever it is, uh, a long time. And I've, I've met with thousands of couples and I have seen more families destroyed over a death in the family, not from the loss of the patriarch, right? So the, the father passes away, leaves a bunch of money to the family with no will, no estate plan put together and the family completely rips itself apart. Tears over, itself apart. Yeah. You know, Oh, you know, somebody's trying to get this and somebody wants that. And, and, you know, there's, there's no direction and everybody's mad at everybody now. And I mean, I, I literally have seen families explode to where nobody talks to each other ever and again. It, yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's a terrible thing. And that's even what the, that's not what the parent wanted. Well, and it's so avoidable, right? And this is kind of morphing into an estate planning discussion, which yeah. I didn't necessarily intend to. But, <laughs> Sorry. but, no, but, but, but no, but but on this point, it you know, people don't like talking about their own mortality, whatever. We're all procrastinators. But to your point, it's one of the worst, most toxic things you can do to your family to die without a plan, at least communicating kind of your general mm -hmm. desires of who should get what, right? Because otherwise it just becomes Lord of the Flies, right? Yeah. Um, and and look, maybe, maybe at some point if there's interest. We've already talked about doing kind of a retirement planning uh, event for for this audience. If folks are interested in the estate planning one, we could do, easily do that too. Mention that in the, the comments below. All right, Lance, real quick in the last couple of minutes we have here, I want to talk about um, children, or in your case, the Taliban. Exactly. Um, so, uh, by the uh, way, by by the way, I love my Taliban. You love your children. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, you know. Um, we do, as you just said, we do a crappy job of teaching financial literacy in our education system. So without help, kids aren't going to learn anything, right? And one of the best practices or better practices that I've seen is families, and you don't have to have a lot of means to do this, but families that have almost sort of like an annual shareholders meeting yep. with their kids once their kids get to a certain age. And I think kind of, you know, middle school, certainly high school, they're old enough to do this where you sit down, you have to tell them everything, but you kind of tell them, okay, this is sort of where our general investments are right now. These are sort of the decisions that we're making. These are assets that someday kids, you know, if you have enough, maybe getting passed down to you. We want you to kind of know where things are. We want to foster the discussion in your mind of, you know, what don't you understand about this? What questions do you have? And then you sort of set some shared goals like, hey, here's, here's a hundred bucks or 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. Let's invest this as a family. Hey, everybody, let's have a discussion about what stock should we put it in this year or whatever. Again, just kind of beginning to exercise those muscles, give kids an entry into, you know, being a steward of capital and all that stuff. I see you sort of smiling and nodding as I'm saying this, but again, from your perch, you're probably best positioned to see what works and doesn't work here. So what do you have to say on this topic? Well, uh, two things. One is that if your kids are in school and they come home and they tell you that they're doing an investing class at school, take them out. Um, the, the reason is, and, and just say, just tell the teacher that your child is not going to participate in this. And the reason is, is that the, the way these classes are taught, all it teaches them is how to gamble. It doesn't teach them how to invest. It's like, here, you have this, this mythical pot of money. And by the end of the semester, whoever does best wins. And so the way you win that game is by buying the most speculative stocks in a market and hope they run up a bunch. So I buy penny stocks because those have the, the biggest chance of percentage gains. So, we're, But we're not teaching our kids anything but how to invest. And, and, and that's a terrible way to teach kids money. So if they come home to do that, just take them out of the class and, or tell the teacher they're not going to participate. Um, the, the second thing is, is that, you know, I made the mistake of telling my kids where the assets are and they've been plotting my demise ever since. So just be aware, just be aware if your kids are the Taliban like mine, <laughs> there is a risk. <laughs> so, but you know, it, no, it's, it's very yeah, important. Just to, don't tell them how big the insurance policy is. <laughs> exactly. Um, but seriously, you know, there's, you know, there's some great way. Look, I, I can just tell you how I, I, I'm just going to tell you how I do my kids, right? I, I can't, I can't give you advice on your kids and everybody's different. Um, when my kids turn 16, I make them get a job. Um, I make them, they want a car. They've got to save up the down payment on the car. I match their down payment, just like they have a 401k plan. So it encourages them to save money. Once they get the down payment for the car, they buy the car, they have to make the monthly note. 
They've got to pay for their own gas. They have to pay for their insurance. So they've got to work and they've got to get good grades in school. So if one lacks, if, if they come home with bad grades, then they lose the car. So even though they're paying for it. So, but there has to be both reward and risk uh, to them to teach them the value of money and, and saving and the importance of that. It's also important to say, look, you're earning money. This is great. I want you to save a third, spend a third and, and give a third, you know, so take them to church, let them tithe, let them contribute to charity. They need to learn the value of giving. They need to learn the, the value of being a good steward to society. Um, but they need to learn the value of saving, but they also need to be rewarded for that hard work. So let them go spend some money, right? So they can go buy whatever they want. Um, but as they save money, we reward them just like a 401k matching plan. So when they save up so much money, we'll help contribute to that little pot that they've got that they can go get something that they really like. So there's a reward, reward process for doing this, but it's teaching them the value of money. And then as, as they keep getting older, we keep pushing more and more responsibility onto them. So now they're all getting ready to go to college and they have to pay for their own school. We do not pay for their college. We will help them ultimately if they need help. They don't know that, by the way. So I hope they're not watching this video. Um, <laughs> but it's, they're, they're responsible. They will work their way through school. They will make good grades. They will do those type of things because that's that's the responsibility that we bestowed upon them. And they understand that that's the value that we're teaching them. And we relay that message to them constantly. Hey, we're not being a hard ass. We're not just being mean to you. We're trying to teach you to be a good citizen. And we're trying to teach you to be self-reliant. We don't want you being reliant on other people or being reliant on other things. You need to be reliant on yourself. Again, that's just how we do it. You may agree or you know, people are like, oh my God, you're not paying for college. Uh, you know, <laughs> That's up to you, man. That's that's all you. That's just how we chose to do it because my wife and I worked our way through college. And, you know, so we're just passing our values down to our kids. All right. Well, and obviously that's, you know, what every parent should should do. But, um, uh, you know, I, I presume that you see uh, the de <laughs> the detritus of families that didn't do a good job of this, right? Or or, or potentially worse, um, families that are financially successful, but sort of indulge their kids and don't demand that their kids sort of develop these responsibilities that you're talking about, right? And I, I, I interviewed about a year ago, uh, a personal hero, a guy who wrote a book that made a big difference in my life. Um, and this was, um, uh, gosh, it was Bill Danko, who was one of the co-founders of the book, The Millionaire Next Door, yep. where he and Tom Stanley wrote their two PhDs. Um, they basically just interviewed a couple thousand millionaires and this was back when being a millionaire meant something. And uh, back in the 90s. <laughs> Pre-inflation. <laughs> Pre-inflation. Um, and, uh, and basically just said, look, you know, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not selling you a formula for success. We're just telling you what millionaires have in common, right? What, what data statistically correlates with being a millionaire. And um, one of the, the lessons of the book that really stuck with me is that self-made wealth was generally lost in a generation. And yeah, part of it was because some of the kids were just party animals and just blew the money. But that was really kind of a minority. Um, what, what happened was, is the millionaires who were self-made, you know, would say, God, it was really hard to get to, to my stage in life. I really had to claw my way through a lot of adversity. So they protect their kids and uh, they guide their kids in the quote unquote kind of safer jobs, become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. And the kids may actually earn a good good decent uh income um but they they just hadn't learned the the lessons about dealing with financial adversity or how hard it is to save or whatnot and they tend to just kind of they they they, they keep their spending going no matter what's happening in their lives and they generally kind of by the time they have kids once they're gone their kids aren't inheriting much from them so that that wealth that was made by the initial millionaire you know kind of lasts for two generations and is kind of gone after that um, and so, you know, to, to me, the really important thing is, is, okay, how, how do you, how do you instill these values in your kids and how do you help them, but how do you not help them too much, right? How do you, how do you not cross that line to enabling? Well, that's, that's a great question. So I've seen about a billion estate plans and not quite a billion, maybe like 900 yeah. million. Um, but in, in most estate plans, kind of the run of the mill, Kind of boiler. Look, every lawyer does this, right? And I'm not poo-pooing lawyers. So if you're an estate lawyer, I'm not. I'm not banging on you. But most lawyers kind of run a boilerplate estate plan, 
And and in that boilerplate kind of estate plan is is that at the, you know once the you know patriarch dies, then at 35 years of age, the kid gets one third of the assets. At 40 years of age, I'm just picking ages, they get another 30 percent, and then at 40 years old, they get another 30 percent or whatever it is. And you know, I don't know about you, Adam, but at 35, I had no financial responsibility. <laughs> You know, and, you know, I was, you know, I'm blowing and going in the world and, and I'm, I'm building businesses and I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, you know, I didn't really start knuckling down. And of course, then you have kids, you've got all this other stuff going on. So that money gets spent really fast. And, you know, first thing they do is when they get that first big hit of cash, they go out and buy a fancy car, they go buy a big house and they go right. buy a boat, you know, whatever it is. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Statistics show that money doesn't survive the first generation in most cases. So, how, how, how did we solve that? Again, let's, I'm just going to tell you how I did it and you can just do whatever you want. Um, we've set our family trust up so that our kids never get the principal. So what they will get is the rest of their life, they will get a paycheck and they, the, the portfolio will generate money and whatever that gets, there's a 4% withdrawal rate out of it and they, can, they get that 4% withdrawal rate split between them that they can use to supplement their incomes. Now, how do they get that money? They have to be gainfully employed, they have to have a college education, and they have to pass a random drug test at the, at the whims of the trustee. So my kids don't do drugs, right? I'm not even worried about that, but the-, the Well, threat, I mean, they do, they do opium. I mean, they are the Taliban, but- that, 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 that is, that, other than that, that's how they make a living. Um, you know, but, you know, but outside of those three things, you know, I just want them to be good citizens. And that's the whole point of what's doing this. And I want them to have that support of, of what I've built for them to help them enjoy a better life. But they've got to be employed. They've got to be good citizens. And then that, that money will pass to their kids, their grandkids, my great, 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 great grandkids down the road. But this is how money survives generations. If you go back and look at the Rockefeller family and those, that's how these trusts are all structured. They pay out but it's never touching the principal. So that money always grows and compounds over time, but that's how you make it survive. Once you give kids or anybody access to capital, it's gonna get lost through divorce. It's gonna get lost through spending. It's gonna get lost through bad investments. It's gonna get lost through a variety of things. And you know, so protect the capital and it's not hard to do just setting up a decent estate plan and doing it the right way. You can shield off a lot of those risks. All right. Awesome. Well, look, um, in wrapping up here. Um, hey, wait, wait, before we wrap up, you know what the yeah. difference is? But you, you want to know what the difference is between a divorce and a bear market? <laughs> sure. What? Well, in a bear market, you still lose half your money, but you still have your wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Financial advisor humor and daddy humor combined in one. Uh, in the so, one, yes. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, look, in, in, in wrapping up here, um, you know, the only thing I'll add to what you said there, Lance, is, is bringing it to, to what my wife and I are looking at is, is the families that I've seen have done a really good job. Um, and, and this is before the, yeah. the, 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 the parents kick off um, is, you know, being selective uh, about how they give economic health to their kids, but, but really doing it in a way that I think I, I look at as sort of like a, a, a tipping point moment where it's like, if I can just give a little bit of help here, it can make a big difference on the trajectory down the road. So it's like, if I can help them get into a house earlier, right? And it's not that I'm buying the house for them, right. but if I can give them a couple years head start, well, there's a lot of benefit that comes from that, right? Um, if they're, you know, working in the, you know, the, the, the rat race and they're at the point where they really think they want to branch out and start something entrepreneurial, but they're still saving up for it. Well, if I can give a little bit to them to get, let them do that a little bit early, right? And, and there can be conditions on it and all sorts of things. Um, it's not just free money or it's not just all the money they need. They still have to do the majority of the work, but it, it, it lets them take advantage of that compounding effect earlier in life. The, 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 there can be pretty dramatic benefits to that. And I've got one or two examples that honestly would take too long to explain right now here at the end of this <laughs> one. Maybe we, we talk about it a bit later in a different video. Uh, but anyways, um, I think that's another good way to look at it too, which is like, where are the moments in their lives where a little bit of money can make the biggest outside look, positive difference in their life. Absolutely. Look, you know, it's like, it's like my son, he's, he's, you know, he's going to college to major in engineering and he wants to own his own business someday. And so, you know, we've already got a plan together. Once he graduates college, gets his PhD, 
He's going to go work in the workforce for a few years, and then we'll start a business together. I'll I'll provide the capital to start the business. Um, you know, but there's and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's things that we can. And the beauty, the beautiful thing about having money and of, 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 and where you've got some security is it does give you that flexibility to help your kids get that jump off point that you didn't, I didn't have that. No, nobody helped me at all ever. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's been a function that if I can help my kids have that jump off point to your, to, to your point and get them that accelerated race, you know, that's fantastic, but you know, it's a business and you have to treat it like a business. So if you're going to help them, you know, put a down payment on the house, it needs to be structured like a business. It's not just giving them money. It's a loan. You draft up a loan document. You you give them the money. You help them get started, but make them responsible for that payback. If you want to forgive the loan at some point, that's up to you. But they need to understand that it is part of that business cycle. And so, if you treat it like a business, a it'll make sure your your relationship stays good. The biggest the biggest problem with relationships between family members, period, comes down to misunderstandings between what you thought you were doing. And what they thought you were doing exactly and and so having it docu always document everything it's in writing everybody's on the same page literally about what you're doing and because money again i just can't tell you how many families i've seen blow up over the smallest things relating to money i mean literally to the point that family members have sued each other and it's just stupid because it's over money yeah i totally agree i agree with everything you said there too the the one thing i'll, I'll include is is you know what you want to do as a parent and and you know Lance, like you i'm self-made um you know you you got to preserve the struggle in there mm -hmm. for them you, you can't you can't you know if, if if you're removing the struggle then you're enabling then you're creating a dependent right mm -hmm. um that's a huge part of the, the the education that they need to learn there all right on that folks really interesting conversation this week lance we, we kind of morphed from markets to the personal finance side about halfway through um, yep. folks hope you liked it um if, if you like to see more of this type of you know um you know markets are for the money you have in the markets the rest of money is just about all the money issues we have to deal with just being regular people living our lives um if you like this type of discussion let us know in the comment section below or if you don't let us know too and we'll use that as a gauge for whether we do more or less of it going forward um, all right, Lance. Well, look, been another wonderful week. Thanks so much for uh, giving so much time. Um, all right, everybody else, uh, don't forget, if you have not yet availed yourself of a free consultation with Lance's firm or one of the other financial advisory firms that Wealthion uh, endorses, I think we gave you a litany of reasons uh, in this conversation why just talking to these guys is not a bad thing to do at this point in time. Uh, no obligation, no cost. Uh, if you're interested in that, just go to Wealthion. Dot com. Um, and if you continue to enjoy this series, I think this is the 21st recap we've now done, Lance. Do me a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And other than that, folks, have yourselves a great weekend. Lance, thanks so much, buddy. Everybody, thanks for watching.